Next, from Chicago, the City Club of Chicago celebrates 50 years of service from Chicago Alderman Edward Burke of the 14th Ward. Mayor Emanuel introduces Alderman Burke, and then Burke recounts his 50 years of service and the many changes the city has seen over the past half century. This runs about 30 minutes. On a serious note, we are here today to celebrate the legendary Chicagoan for his 50 years of service to not only the residents of his neighborhood, but to the entire city of Chicago, Chairman Ed Burke. And I want you to put those 50 years in perspective, because 50 years ago this year, we unveiled the Picasso in Daly Plaza. 50 years ago, the Chicago Bears were still playing in Wrigley Field. 50 years ago, the tallest building in Chicago was the Daly Center. Now it's the 31st tallest building. And 50 years ago, it had been a full six, decade, six decades. Now, this is a bit risky for a North Sider to say this about a South Sider, but the Cubs had won the World Series six de decades earlier. But I can say this as a son and a grandson. It was also 50 years ago, a young police officer took leave from the force to replace his father as a 14th Ward committeeman. And at age 24, he was the youngest Chicagoan ever to hold that job. He still holds that job today. And anyone, any know, anyone who knows Chairman Burke knows him as a walking encyclopedia of Chicago history. He not only wrote the, the book on Chicago, he wrote several books on Chicago. And rarely has a public servant taught so much to so many. We have all learned a lot from Chairman Burke. In my relatively short time as mayor, here's what I've learned about Chairman Burke. In committee after committee, in council after council, his command of history and respect for the process elevates all of our efforts as public servants. He raises a level of decorum. He dignifies the process we are all part of. He has been a mentor to countless young and aspiring public servants and a friend to generations of Chicagoans. He has never forgotten where he came from, and he still approaches his job with the zeal and passion of a 24-year-old committeeman filling his father's big shoes. And I know that Joseph Burke could not have been more proud of the job his son is doing, delivering impeccable neighborhood services to his constituents, making the communities in the city he loves better and stronger for his efforts. Chairman Burke, over the years, has given me many books to read, books that have influenced me, and one of them actually is in the news now, and you've heard, probably read about what the city did on opiates. A number of years ago, he gave me a book called Dreamland, which I ended up also giving to President Obama, and it actually was the inspiration behind the city's lawsuit back in 2014 of the man drug manufacturers around opiates. But many of the books are about Chicago's police department, its history, the history of the Irish people in building the city of Chicago, and how those two intertwine, and our political history. So today I wanted to return the favor and give two books to the chairman. One, Pastrami on Rye, an overstuffed history of the Jewish deli experience. <laughs> And we can go to Manny's together and we'll see if you can pass the written exam my mother will give you. <laughs> and another is remembering Chicago's Jews and a history of the Jewish people here in the city of Chicago. And I'm sure you will read it with the pride also and the interest that I read also all the books that you give me. So I want now to introduce a friend to all of us in this room, a friend mm -hmm. to the people he represents, and most importantly, to our great benefit, a friend to the city of Chicago, the most American of American cities, Chairman Ed Burke. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and Mayor, thank you so much for that very kind and uh, gracious introduction. Um, it's truly an honor to be able to join with all of you uh, today at the City Club uh, and 
permit me to express my appreciation for your presence. In nearly a half century of public life in Chicago, 49 years as the alderman of the 14th Ward, with my 50th anniversary as committeeman coming up in July, you can imagine that I've attended many memorable dinners and receptions, a good many at this restaurant. But I have to confess that this is a rare honor to keynote an event that focuses on my career. You can imagine a flood of memories surface when I think back to the 240 members of the City Council with whom I have served since 1969. It's a humbling experience to reflect back on nearly a half century at City Hall. I've been privileged to have been a witness and at times a participant in so many historic and defining moments in Chicago history. I recall with warm regard and sentiment the faces and the names of past and present colleagues, the outcomes to important and often vexing issues of the days, and the many political battles, both won and lost, that live on in memory. In political life, we can count our victories by the services we can render that will enhance the greater good of communities and improve the quality of life. Skeptics, of course, will dismiss that notion as insincere and out of step with some of the negative aspects of historic political life. Yes, history will concede there have been plenty of rascals who saw in Chicago an opportunity to make a quick score. But there were also many more statesmen who furthered the interests of this city quietly and with great dignity. One of them was United States Senator Paul Howard Douglas, who launched, launched his distinguished career in government with his election to the Chicago City Council in 1939. As the alderman of the Fifth Ward, Alderman Douglas championed public education reform, fiscal austerity, improved standards of housing, and lower public transportation fares. In 1942, at the age of 50, Alderman Douglas resigned from the University of Chicago and left City Hall. He enlisted as a private in the United States Marine Corps. He saw heavy action in the Pacific Theater during World War II, where he was badly wounded and disabled in the invasion of Okinawa. He rose from private to lieutenant colonel. In a recently published book titled, Mr. Chairman, Power and Prominence in City Hall, and yes, I did give the mayor a copy, the author, Rich Lindbergh, profiled the lives and careers of all 57 chairmen of the Committee on Finance, dating back to the city charter of 1837. We find in these compelling biographical profiles numerous accounts of courage, philanthropy, and leadership. It was 19th century Alderman Daniel Kimball Persons for example, who donated the equivalent of $144 million during his lifetime to fund a dozen area colleges and hospitals. Chairman Amos Gager Troop, for whom Troop Street is named, founded the California Institute of Technology, commonly known as Caltech. Civil War era Chairman John Comiskey battled political corruption throughout his council tenure, earning the nickname of Honest John Comiskey. It was he who raised the heroic Irish Brigade of volunteers 
at the beginning of the Civil War, and it was his son Charles who founded the Chicago White Sox. Eight former finance chairmen went on to become mayors of Chicago, and three served in the United States Congress. All of them were optimists about the possibilities and future promise of Chicago, as they reminded us that public service embodies the principles of championing the common good. For most of us, we enter the political spectrum out of a desire to achieve social equality. We balance the scales of justice through active civic engagement. It's our duty to articulate the issues before the public and set the tone for future progress. It is, one might say, a calling. British statesman Winston Churchill said it best when he observed, we make a living by what we do, but we make a life by what we give. Mr. Churchill's quote has been on my mind as I reflect upon some of the pieces of legislation and weigh the pros and cons of the impact of these ordinances that have crossed my desk over a half century. As I look back and reflect on what has been accomplished, I can take pride in several meaningful measures that have withstood the test of time and improved the quality of life for the people of this great metropolis. It was June 1990 when the City Council first took up the issue of underage tobacco use, a proposal that faced stiff opposition from the tobacco lobby, the vending machine manufacturers, and outdoor billboard advertisers. Of course, as many of you know, my father, Alderman Joe Burke, had died from the ravages of lung cancer. He was a victim of tobacco in this country, and at only 56 years of age, he passed away. Dr. Lewis Sullivan, the Secretary of Health and Human Services at that time, reported that one in six deaths in the United States were attributable to smoking, and that 90% of smokers became addicted to nicotine as children. And you know, it took 18 years before I was able to persuade the City Council to pass the Clean Indoor Air Ordinance, banning smoking in public places. Next, we followed Dr. Sullivan's recommendations and strengthened existing laws that barred minors from purchasing and using tobacco. Today, the age for purchasing tobacco is 21 in Chicago. The measure prohibited the placement of cigarette vending machines in establishments that admitted minors. That ordinance passed on January 11, 1991. And with victory in hand, we pushed for a citywide smoking ban, but achieved a more modest aim by eliminating the distribution of free cigarettes and smoking in the workplace. They were among the toughest anti-smoking ordinances in the nation up to that time. But today, as the mayor mentioned in his introduction, we confront an even more dangerous and sinister public health menace, which imperils every single family in our nation. Opioid abuse in metropolitan Chicago accounted for 1,085 deaths in Cook County just last year. In 2017, the Chicago Fire Department treated 7,527 overdose victims of this deadly menace. In October of 2016, Mayor Emanuel, President Preckwinkle, Commissioner Boykin and I convened a landmark regional summit to combat opioid and heroin addiction. Considerable thought and planning went into the drafting of 36 recommendations contained in the final report issued by the task force. The task force identified reforms to improve prevention and response to heroin use and addiction. And many of those reforms have already been implemented, even as we speak. 
and they are saving lives. There's something else in which I can take some pride. We proposed an ordinance mandating the installation of carbon monoxide detectors within 40 feet of every sleeping room in residential and mixed occupancy dwellings in Chicago. Chicago was the first city to adopt this life-saving measure. In another public safety issue, we proposed a life-saving ordinance to install automatic external defibrillators in city-owned public buildings and large private buildings, including office, skyscrapers, and health clubs. We've waged a 20-year campaign against distracted driving. Before the widespread appeal of cell phone texting, distracted drivers were often observed reading newspapers in traffic, shaving, and applying makeup. Today, distracted driving poses a far greater threat. The number of highway deaths from distracted driving, accessing their phones, has risen 6% in Illinois just in the last year. The Committee on Finances convened hearings to consider equipping Chicago police with the Textalizer, a digital intelligence application that permits law enforcement to plug in a distracted driver's cell phone following an accident in traffic. That will determine if the driver was texting while behind the wheel. It's my belief and one that is shared by many of our colleagues in the city council that the Textalizer will prevent injuries and save lives. That measure is presently under review and consideration. It was early in my aldermanic career that I joined with then Alderman Mike Volandic in the fight against the sale of phosphate containing detergents that had imperiled our lakes and streams. Environmentalists blamed the contamination of Lake Erie on phosphates. We couldn't permit a similar fate to befall Lake Michigan. That was back in 1970, the year of the first Earth Day, a global movement that awakened the public to the fragility of our natural environment and the danger of hazardous chemicals and pollutants, not only to the planet, but to the health and the well-being of our citizens. Our ordinance required retailers to dispose of those products and replace them with zero phosphate cleaners within a reasonable 30-day time frame. The City Council passed the ordinance in October of 1970, and soon other municipalities and states followed Chicago's precedent by enacting similar measures of their own. Procter & Gamble, however, along with the FMC Corporation, took their legal battle to overturn the ordinance all the way to the United States Supreme Court. We prevailed, and the High Court upheld our law Thankfully, Lake Michigan remains clean and pure and never went the unfortunate way of its sister, Lake Erie. In the early 1990s, a time when Chicago recycled only 3% of its waste, we introduced an ordinance requiring all high-density buildings in the city to implement an effective recycling program separating recyclable materials like paper and glass and metals from garbage waste. The program called source separation was a first here in Chicago. From time to time, I found myself in court battles with the powerful utilities. My late co-counsel, Sidney Karasik, and I repeatedly brought actions against the utilities. We took people's gas to court in order to get them to upgrade and improve the shabby condition of the company's aging gas meters, which caused Chicago residents to pay higher bills, which were unfairly inflated. In the end, the meters were replaced, saving customers millions and millions of dollars. Sometimes, however, the best of intentions fail. It was July of 1999 that I supported an effort to exonerate Shoeless Joe Jackson from complicity in the 1919 Black Sox scandal. The conspiracy to fix the, fix the World Series that year by gangster Arnold Rothstein and his co-conspirators. On the eve of the 80th anniversary of that ill-fated White Sox championship season, it was our hope to vindicate Joe's reputation 
in order to pave the way for his eventual enshrinement into baseball's Hall of Fame. The commissioner and the major leagues, however, gave us a cold shoulder, and Joe has, to this day, never been cleared. But we did achieve better results in exonerating poor Catherine O'Leary for her responsibility for the Chicago Fire, which began on her property the night of October 8, 1871. For 128 years, the historical record blamed Kate and the family milk cow for igniting the conflagration that scorched and flattened the entire city from 12th Street all the way to Fullerton rendering 90,000 people homeless. Reliable research identifies the prob probable suspect, Dennis Pegleg Sullivan. He was something of a neighborhood ne'er-do-well, and it is believed that his carelessness with his pipe ignited the hay in the O'Leary barn while Kate and her family slept soundly in their beds. Recent evidence suggests that he was attempting to steal a pail of milk for punch from the O'Leary barn during a party at the Patrick McLaughlin resident next door. Regardless, the O'Leary descendants no longer have to shoulder the burden of responsibility for that treasure. Rest easy now, Kate. You're entirely blameless. <laughs> I feel privileged to have been a front row witness to history, a great human drama, and a passing parade that fires the imagination and stimulates the intellect. The ancient Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times, is especially true of my half century at City Hall. Although I hasten to add that another ancient Chinese proverb explains that the original proverb was actually intended as a curse. <laughs> Whatever the case, I am very blessed to live and work in this most American of American cities. As the famous 19th century actress Sarah Barnhart once said, I adore Chicago. It is the pulse of America. I couldn't agree more. A final word. Three weeks ago yesterday, Chicago Police Commander Paul Bauer took a brave and a heroic stand against an armed felon in the shadow of City Hall. And by doing so, he lost his life. Chicago lost a valiant and noble man, a respected leader, a friend, and a colleague a devoted husband and father. Commander Bauer will live on in our memories and his memory will never be forgotten. He served the Department of Police and his city with faith and determination while demonstrating an unbreakable bond of valor in defense of the common good in his career of public service. But in a senseless moment of violence, underscoring the tragic inability of this nation to enact intelligent and meaningful gun control measures to prevent the sale and distribution of extra ammo gun magazines, automatic weapons, bump stocks to criminal offenders and disturbed individuals, another man died. It is our hope that out of this sorrowful tragedy will come a renewed call to action and the recognition that through unity, evil such as this can and will be overcome. Indeed, 1968 was an eventful year in my life. I graduated law school, became a Democratic Ward commitment, passed the bar exam, witnessed the creation of Special Olympics, and was sworn in as an attorney. But the most important anniversary for me, however, 
is May 25th. This coming May 25th, Anne and I will celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. I know that everyone present here this afternoon would agree that I married up. <laughs> For half a century, Anne has been my partner in this life through thick and thin. How blessed. I have been, and I love you. Thank you for being my partner in life. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I think we all feel privileged that we were here to hear the words from Alderman Ed Burke, um, his perspective, his sense of where the city has come from and where we may be going, gives us a lot to think about as many of us who are involved in making this city the great city that it is. We just celebrated the city's birth date and we want to thank you once again Alderman Burke for gracing us with your presence. The question is, did your spouse have an affirmative or a negative impact on your career? <laughs> on advice of counsel, I ref refuse to answer that question. <laughs> Alderman Burke informs me that um, he has a very important meeting that he has to go to, so we're going to belay our normal Q&A period in respect to this dean of, uh, but thank you for participating not only at our luncheon today, but in the um, Polar Plunge last Saturday and Sunday. Several people wanted to know about the bathing suit that you had, but we're not going to press that, Alderman. <laughs> we just want to say thank you very much, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you.